tunnels and the shadows. Someone is watching. I am not really a wicked man. Love me and you shall see. Look at me. You wanted to know what I look like. Feast your eyes and glut your soul on my cursed ugliness. If I am the Phantom, it is because man's hatred has made me so. If I am to be saved, it is because your love redeems me. These are the immortal words written by Gaston Leroux in his breakout novel, The Phantom of the Opera. It was released in France in 1909, and although numerous incarnations of The Phantom have existed, the most indomitable remains the first film adaptation released in 1925. It was a silent film distributed by Universal and produced by Carl Lemley, the founder and studio head, who went on to produce over 400 films for the company. He cast the great Lon Chaney, a prominent actor, makeup artist, and auteur known widely as the Man with a Thousand Faces. Chaney would take on the role of Eric the Phantom just two years prior having played Quasimodo in The Hunchback of Notre Dame. The film shot in Los Angeles on the burgeoning lot that was becoming Universal City. Lemley was set on making the scope of this film bigger than anything previous. He commissioned a full-scale replica of the Parisian Opera House. It was the first set constructed with concrete and steel girders, and it was erected on Soundstage 28, where it remained. This set, an exact replica of the Paris Opera, was the scene of Universal's most exciting production during the silent era, the Phantom of the Opera. The 1925 release was one of the greatest of all horror films. Its star, Lon Chaney, the man of a thousand faces, shattered audiences with his most grotesque face yet. That of Eric, the phantom of the title. Over the last 85 years, it's been used countless times whenever a Universal film has needed a theater set. Even though the set was used several times over, it was always referred to as the phantom stage and over the years it began to develop a reputation. Numerous reports began to indicate that paranormal occurrences were drawn to the set. In other words, the soundstage was haunted. Some individuals have reported to seeing a caped figure in the catwalk, while instances usually refer to lights turning on and off and doors slamming shut. All of which was somewhat parodied in a 1986 episode of Knight Rider. Don't you think someone's trying to destroy your movie, such as the Phantom of Stage 28? Action! <laughs> The Phantom of Stage 28? Let's just call him a guy in a monk suit, okay? Well, now, I saw that guy this tonight, and he was real. The Phantom was coming apart, and for whatever reason, he went to Disneyland. Throughout the mid to late 60s, he appeared as a costumed character, even in 1967 meeting supermodel Twiggy. He was usually found on Main Street near the theater until, eventually the show was over, and just like that, he was gone. Shortly after that, he came back to Universal Studios. Throughout the mid to late 60s, all of the Universal monsters invaded the studio tour. Chief among them was, of course, the Phantom himself. The costume character appeared for meet and greets throughout the tour. By August of 1975, Monster Mania had consumed culture. The horror movies of the past came back to Universal. The park introduced a horror makeup show called The Land of a Thousand Faces, later retitled The Show of a Thousand Faces. The show performed around 10 times a day and could hold an audience of 1,500 guests. It showed a video and talked about the legacy of Lon Chaney, all while transforming two guests into Frankenstein and the Bride of Frankenstein. The show lasted until 1979, but before it closed, it featured Universal Television's newest monster. The Incredible Hulk came crashing in and caused havoc on the show's host and all of the unsuspecting audience members. Universal Television began producing The Incredible Hulk in 1978 and intended to make full use out of its newly acquired IP. Soon after the show was closed, the theater was closed. Closed in. A castle was erected, and on the spooky Friday the 13th in June of 1980, Castle Dracula opened. An ad ran in the paper proclaiming, We spent three million to make your nightmares come true. It again featured an interactive guest experience where two audience members were chosen to portray Frankenstein's monster and the bride. It also featured an animatronic werewolf, and an animatronic Phantom of the Opera. Vocally, the Phantom was initially portrayed by character actor and all-around goon, Paul Lind. Yes, 
Even I was incarnated here. I, Eric, they called me a Phantom of the Opera. He was changed after his voice was too recognizable. It was switched to John Goodwin. Yes, even I was incarnated here. I, Eric, they called me a Phantom of the Opera. All of the monsters were again joined by, of course, the Incredible Hulk. The show closed in 1983, and it was replaced by Conan, Sword and Sorcery Spectacular. But the Phantom would not be silenced at all. The Universal Monsters were about to be saved by an unlikely hero. <laughs> Tim Burton's Beetlejuice, released in 1988, was a box office smash. Universal quickly acquired the theme park rights, and in 1991, Conan would be replaced by Beetlejuice's Rock and Roll Graveyard Review, a jukebox show led by Beetlejuice, where he would be joined by drab versions of all the original monsters. He would smoke them out and totally transform them into rockin' versions of themselves. They sang and danced to a pretty random selection of music, wherein every monster got their moment. Right now it's time for the Graveyard Roll Call. Here's a guy back from a chandelier tour in the sewers of Las Vegas. He's bad, 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 bad. Put your hands together for the Phantom of the Opera. Let's go. The show eventually opened in 1992 in Universal Florida, and in Universal Japan in 2001. The show went through multiple iterations and several interpretations. At one point, the Phantom of the Opera's daughter, Fantasia, appeared. She was a pink-haired DJ that sang along with a number of different songs. Ultimately, the Hollywood one closed in 1999, and the Florida one in 2016. The Japan iteration was eventually revamped to Universal Monster Rock. The show was very similar to the original version, but instead of Beetlejuice, there was an MC host. The show continues to this day. It's in the Hollywood section in the Pantages Theater. The Pantages Theater in Universal Florida had a different path. When it would first open in 1991, as the Phantom of the Opera Horror Makeup Show. The location featured original props in the theater lobby, followed by a pre-show. However, the rest of the show was slightly more comedic, and the show was altered. This is Barbie. <laughs> the pre-show was eventually revamped, and it was renamed to just the Universal Horror Makeup Show, which it still operates as today. In 1972, just north of Cincinnati in Mason, Ohio, Kings Island opened. The 364-acre park was built by Taft Broadcasting. They had just recently acquired the rights to Hanna-Barbera, which they used to create Happy Land of Hanna-Barbera. Within it was the Enchanted Voyage, a boat ride that resembled It's a Small World. It was the park's most expensive ride at the time, costing $2 million. It closed in 1981, and it was replaced with the Smurfs' Enchanted Voyage. You followed the Smurfs as they went through different holiday seasons. This lasted until 1991, 
when Rand R. Creative Amusement was hired to design a new ride to replace the Smurfs. It was time for the Phantom to come back to the theater. Beware Mikey tough things in the dark. Cause Dad's taking us to King's Island and the Phantom Theater. Down in the shadows there's this guy and he looks like man. He was the maestro. The maestro, that's who. I didn't see who. You didn't? Phantom Theater. New at King's Island. Initial concepts showed guests trudging through part of an old abandoned theater occupied by ghouls. Hi Jason, I'm Rick Bassett from r, r Design. This is my partner, Richard Farron, and we'd like to take you on a backstage tour of the Phantom Theater here at King's Island. Around 1910 to 1915 is when we created this theater to actually exist. Now these guys here have been running around since that time, kind of turned into phantoms. They refuse to leave or refuse to believe that the vaudevillian era is over. And so that's the feel of the whole thing. These are fully custom characters. There's no characters like this anywhere else in the world. Um, these characters were created specifically for the Phantom Theater. Throughout the entire show, what we've tried to do is make a real fun type of show. There's a lot of little twinges of horror and little scary type of things, but all the way through we wanted to have a lot of fun so the whole family can have fun on this. It's for little kids and grown-ups and teenagers and everything else. There's something for everybody, hopefully, all the way through the show. The boat ride was changed to the new Omnivore Mover system used in Disney's Haunted Mansion. The family-friendly attraction boasted over 30 animatronics and over a dozen cutting-edge FX. The ride opened in 1992, and it was a pretty immediate success, even being attended by its predecessors. When you entered the ride, you saw acts for posters that had previously performed at the theater, and might still be there. Once you traveled through the queue, you entered into a short pre-show. Well now, come to the maestro, have you? <laughs> you think you're brave enough to go inside? <laughs> the mystery of the phantom theater awaits you through that door. <laughs> As you move through the theater, you'd head backstage and all around, meeting all of the haunting figures, going through even the boiler room. <laughs> Sadly, in 2002, Hanna-Barbera came back to King's Island, when the ride was revamped to Scooby-Doo's Haunted Castle, a shooting game where you had to hunt ghosts. In 2010, Hanna-Barbera left the parks, and the ride was only slightly altered, and it became Boo Blasters on Boo Hill, which it currently operates as at Kings Island and three other Cedar Fair parks. Each year, however, the park's annual Halloween haunt, rides and vehicles from the Phantom Theater can still be seen. In 1986, the Phantom finally came to own the theater. Andrew Lloyd Webber's newest musical premiered on the London West End, and by 1988, it had already won the Tony for Best Musical and broken several box office records. The spark of inspiration. The glow of desire. Discover a passion unmatched, where music, romance and spectacle combine in a single blaze of glory. Andrew Lloyd Webber's The Phantom of the Opera. And it eventually became the longest running musical in Broadway history. It also toured the world several times over, so much so that in 1998 the Godard Group was contracted to design Fantasy, an upscale Las Vegas casino built around Andrew Lloyd Webber's Phantom, wherein every night a supersized FX version of the show would play. Guests would become fully immersed in the world with water flooding separately built rows. The Las Vegas Spectacular is the Strip's newest hit with audiences and critics alike. And while it was never realized, a scaled down version ran at the Venetian Casino in Las Vegas from June 24, 2000 to September 2, 2012. The show included some of the designed FX, like a chandelier that fell apart and came back together, but it was shortened to a 95 minute runtime. Universal never really let go of the Phantom. It was held on through promotions and used its several versions of Halloween Horror Nights. In 2007, Universal Hollywood really doubled down on the monsters with Universal's House of Horrors. The attraction was the fifth walkthrough attraction to be featured at Stage 13. Prior to this, there was Chicken Run, Grinchmas, The Mummy, and 
Van Helsing's Fortress Dracula. The area was essentially a year-round haunted house that featured sets and props from Universal Horror Films. It closed in 2015, and it was replaced in 2016 by a walkthrough Walking Dead attraction. Way back in 1989, Universal Hollywood had plans for Soundstage 28. The Godard Group was in charge of designing the Theater of Horrors. It was part live stage show, part filmed, mixed with cutting edge FX. It would have utilized the original set and would begin when the lights would dim and the organ music would play. A voice would introduce the audience to Soundstage 28, and then a short clip show would run, documenting Universal's past with horror films. A hostess would then emerge, documenting all of Universal's monsters. She would go down the list, and then another film would play, just as the show was beginning to crumble. The clips would eventually become harder and harder to see until the film burns through. The Phantom's voice would be heard and the organ would rev up. The theater would slowly transition into a melancholy nightmare. The hostess would become trapped. Pretty soon, plants, skeletons, and all of the interior would begin to come to life. The Phantom would finally appear playing his organ with wild abandonment as ghosts began to emanate from the pipes throughout the atmosphere of the room. The chandelier, the ceiling, and everything would fall right to the audience. The attraction was never built, and in 2014, Universal began to go ahead with plans to demolish the nearly century-old soundstage. Parts of the Parisian Opera House were preserved as it's one of the oldest surviving film sets. But the rest of the soundstage is gone, along with the past. Presenting Sheer Madness, Highlands Moonlight Madness Sale. Now through Saturday, every Highland store will go raving mad with shocking reductions of 5 to 40% on everything in the store. Like a space-saving microwave oven with timer. Now, just $77. Highland's Moonlight Madness Sale. Get there by Saturday before the curtain falls. <laughs> 